six months after we launched Equal Rights Institute, Students for Life asked me to deliver a practical dialogue tip speech at their two national conferences. And we were really excited for this opportunity to show um, a, you know, a few large audiences some of the things that we had been thinking about um, in this area of nitty gritty dialogue tips. So I remember walking around this huge parking lot that was outside the office that we used to be in, um, working on this talk and finally recording it so that Tim could listen to it. I'm um, thinking he'd be like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. And it was a pretty humbling experience <laughs> for when Tim started like pausing it every like 20 seconds or so with like, oh, here's like something different we should say there. Um, and so Tim ended up getting really involved in, in the writing of this speech and he made it a lot better. Um, and so the, the difference between the first talk that I sort of wrote um, and what ended up being the speech that I gave um, was very different. It was very improved um, from this, uh, from just a lot of work um, that we both put into it. Of the six practical dialogue tips that we wrote about in that speech, the one that I was the most proud to deliver was the last tip. And that's the one that resulted in also writing this blog post. There were a lot of practical dialogue tips that Tim and I had both taught before we launched ERI. But the cool thing that happened when we launched ERI was that um, we could now say whatever we wanted to say about dialogue tips. And, and there are certain things about um, our style when we talk to virtuous people that are fairly unique. Um, and now being at ERI, we could talk about those things. Um, we could kind of go where we wanted to go or teach pro-life people certain things um, uh, about dialogue style that was just different from, from where we had, had been before. This is one of those things. Um, this is one of those things that I was even a little bit nervous about delivering because it was the only part that I felt was really controversial. Um, it was so different from what has often been taught by um, apologists that we really, really respect um, I was worried it might come across as disrespectful um, to kind of the people who've, who've come before who just have different styles um, in the way that they teach dialogue. Um, but I was also really excited um, for people to, to hear this idea and at least consider using it in the way that they dialogue. And we were excited enough um, about this idea to end up writing a blog post about it as well. So that is today's article, and it's called Be Open to Letting the Conversation Change Topics. Learning to defend your deeply held beliefs is really important, but it's easy to get into the wrong mindset. Sometimes we get so focused on supporting the arguments for our view and defeating the arguments for the other view that we get, well, weird. We can get into the kind of focus where we are so oblivious to the person in front of us, we might as well be arguing with a robot. Apologetics is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. The end for which we use apologetics is loving people by seeking their best interest. Sometimes that means our dutifully studied arguments become unnecessary. One of the traps that comes along with the territory of studying apologetics is getting into a flowchart mindset. If C says A, you say X. If C says B, you say Y, and so on. But the times I go on autopilot and I'm thinking too much about the argument, I lose track of the person and often the point. This is why it's important to respond to people not merely their statements. And this is why I've learned to let the conversation turn away from abortion. Sometimes. Some people strongly disagree with this idea. They think that you should always stay on the topic that quote-unquote really matters. At Equal Rights Institute, we encourage our students to be open to the possibility that when someone changes the subject to something else, that other subject might be something that they really need to discuss. Here are a few examples. Religion. Some people have told me that if I don't share the gospel in every conversation I have, then I am making a huge mistake. Other people have told me that if I ever let the conversation shift from abortion to religion, then I am making a huge mistake. You can't please everybody. Both of these views are wrong. Both views treat people like formulas instead of like people. People are complicated, so they have different needs. Sometimes people are in desperate need of clear thinking about abortion, and forcing the subject to change to religion is a mistake. But sometimes people need me to tell them why I believe in Jesus a lot more than they need to hear about abortion. Every conversation is a series of difficult judgment calls amidst prayer without ceasing. I don't think I always make the right calls, 
but I certainly don't think I should run every conversation from the same script. Another example, same-sex marriage. Anyone that has tried doing pro-life outreach in the last five years knows that people bring up same-sex marriage very frequently. If I'm talking about abortion and the person suddenly shifts and says, well, what do you think about gay marriage? They might just be doing that because they feel like they're losing on abortion and they want to win. Sometimes my judgment call in the moment is that we were getting somewhere and we need to finish the conversation we were already having first. But sometimes it's an openly gay man or woman made in the image of God asking me if I think God hates them. I think that's a question worth answering. Oftentimes it's someone that has never heard a reasonable and loving Christian explain why they are opposed to same-sex marriage. And if that's the case, then they have handed me a wonderful opportunity. Sometimes when they bring up same-sex marriage, it's all about credibility. Some people will not listen to your argument about abortion until you convince them that you don't blindly hate gay people. I'm not saying that's fair. I'm saying when that's the case, plowing ahead with your pro-life argument is akin to putting your fingers in your ears and humming. It's worth saying that you don't hate gay people and that it's unconscionable and disgusting when people are bullied or abused because they're gay. I'm for the equal right to life of all people born or unborn, regardless of their sexual orientation. I'm not against abortion because I'm just specifically obsessed with fetuses, which is what many pro-choice people think about us. I'm against abortion because it is one particularly egregious example of injustice among many. When you're talking to someone about abortion, what is your agenda? If it's to get them on their knees committing to follow Christ by dinner time, no matter what, you're going to miss great opportunities. If your agenda is to convince them to be pro-life no matter what, you're going to miss great opportunities. When you're in a conversation with an individual made in God's image, your agenda should be loving that person. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for that person is to talk to them about abortion. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do for that person is to talk about something other than abortion. Be willing to get out of your comfort zone if that's what the person needs.